Uh, our third panel today is uh, a, a tried and true panel. This is uh, how to present to VCs. This is part four. We like to say it's a continuing education course, so this is our fourth uh, of the uh, series. And uh, Jonathan Murray, who's going to be moderating here in a second, reminded me I had, I had five or six pages of, of, VC, of uh, you know, intros and bios on these individuals, and Jonathan reminded me, this is 2013, we have LinkedIn. They're all on LinkedIn, you don't need to do that. So with that in mind, I'm only gonna introduce the individuals by name real quickly. Our presenter today is John Steidley. He's the founder and CEO of Intelligent Mobile Support. Uh, we like to think of him as the sacrificial lamb. Please be gentle. Uh, we have three reviewers for us today. We have Mark Kwame, the founder of Drive Capital. We have Steve Haynes, the founder of Glengarry Ventures. And sort of our own version of Paul Lynn in the center square, we have Mike Stubler of Draper Triangle Ventures joining us again for I think the fourth year in a row. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan Murray, our moderator, a member of Early Stage Partners. Jonathan. Thank you, Jim. How many of you are here with us for the first time? Okay, good, and how many of you are entrepreneurs? Okay, so this panel has a particular design to it that's different than most other panels. The purpose of it is so that you can see inside the mind of a VC. <clears throat> I've been on the other side of the table before I stumbled into this career by, by accident. And what I always found when, when I was pitching to VCs was the process was a bit opaque, and I think other people experience that. I think we speak a private language that maybe is a little hard to discern and that we don't always reveal what we really mean when we ask a question. So we might ask a question over here and be intending to elicit information over here. So we designed this panel to enable people in the audience to ask the VCs what they're thinking and why they're asking the questions they're asking. So here's how this goes. Is John is gonna come up and pitch to these VCs and they're gonna interact with him the way that VCs do when you pitch to a VC in their offices. And then we're gonna stop the proceedings when somebody has a question for the VCs. Under the ground rules of this panel, we don't want you in the audience asking questions of the entrepreneur. The poor guy is gonna get peppered enough as it is from these guys. But we do want you to stop things and, and I'll, I'll be walking around with a microphone and to ask the VCs why they asked the question they asked or what they're thinking or at what point in time they're starting to wonder about valuation. And that's the whole purpose of it. I'm, it's meant to be interactive. So I think without further ado, what I'll do is step aside. I'll be down there with a the microphone and invite John Steadley to come up here and start talking about his company. Great, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Uh, my name is John Steadley. I'm the founder and CEO of Intelligent Mobile Support. Uh, we design and market technology solutions that help our customers to win more business, deliver better customer service, and improve productivity to deliver a bottom line. I'm gonna go through some specific examples to make that clear as to what we do. But in essence, we connect a mobile workforce to both experts and information. We work with Carrier, uh, Bryant, Payne in the HVAC world, Linux, primarily through wholesalers. We also work with Steris Corporation to connect their field, ex their field workers back to experts' information to deliver their job uh, quicker, better, faster. I'm sorry, could you take, go back to that slide? Well, who's your largest customer? Uh, currently, our largest customer is uh, Steris. And who would, and, and what percentage of your business would Steris be, and, and how, how much different than like your, your kind of median customer? Um, so, just in absolute numbers, uh, uh, this is a software as a service business. Uh, it's about $54,000 a year for Steris. Our typical is around 30000 a year. Great, thank you. So what is the problem that we address? Uh, experts say that only about 20% of organizational knowledge is actually documented. Uh, I'll look out in the room and ask each of you how much of your job knowledge is actually written down on paper that's available to people. This creates a knowledge gap. And, and individuals are also overloaded with too much information, not the right kind of information. Yet mobile employees need that information immediately to solve real world issues. And they waste a lot of their time seeking information and expertise. And the pain is significant. Uh, it was just at Four Seasons in Chicago, uh, the largest Linux wholesaler in the United States. 
If they have a, a service delivery where they're installing a new HVAC system and that process rolls over to the next day, it costs them $462 per day for missed opportunity. And in sales, buyers report that over a third of deals are lost because the sales force doesn't know how to accurately answer questions. I'm sorry. Um, Jonathan asked me to do this, so I'm trying to be the ugly VC. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Um, so, like, your largest customer, you said, was Carrier, right? Uh, well, it's Steris. It's Steris, okay. And how many people touch your system right now at Steris? Uh, the entire field service organization, uh, which is about 750. So 750 people. And uh, what do you think, uh, see cost per visit. And what is their cost per visit? Uh, their cost per revisit could be well over $500, uh, and mostly it's the, uh, the opportunity cost. It disrupts the schedule right. for the following day. So I'm curious, was Sturis an early customer, or is it, why, why not charge more than $54,000 a year? That seems kind of low to me. Uh, it, it is low, and uh, that was our first customer. Got we it. got in, got locked into uh, too low of a price, but we negotiated a 21 price percent price increase in year two. And, so we're trying to march that price point It's upwards. a term contract for how long? It's a one-year term. It's a one-year term, and so you can up it again in one year. If yes. You'd like. Perfect. Thank okay, you. we have a question. How effective are the footnotes um, <clears throat> in the references? Hmm. I guess, you know, I really don't pay that much attention to them, to be honest with you. I guess it does give it some credibility that it's cited that the, the data came from, from some source, but, you know, frankly, I guess I don't really focus on it. Yeah. Just, just a little bit of color on, on the mar what, what Mark, just, Mark just did, and I know Jonathan prompted him to do it, is that and typically when you're presenting to VCs, and it's very bad in my shop, and we try to cure ourselves of this, and it's impossible, uh, that John was on his second slide or first slide, and he was interrupted with questions that probably would be addressed further on in the deck, and got to the second or third slide and had more questions specific to customers and revenue models and things that John was, I'm sure, prepared to cover further in the deck, and I think that's just... It's very indicative of, of how presentations go. You always have partners in your firm who won't wait and <laughs> jump, jump further ahead in the presentation. So, you know, John handled that very well, didn't, didn't get rattled and, and did a great job. Did a good job with it. The, the, the one thing that, that you're trying to do as a VC, just to put on top of that, is, you know, we see hundreds, if not thousands, of companies. Um, and so I'm trying to understand his business in the first three or four slides. So then I can ask the real intelligent questions, hopefully, at the end. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to grasp what's going on right now. And so, so for example, in those couple of questions, I got a pretty good idea of, of how, he is, how he is addressing his marketplace and, and the companies that are interested in what he's doing. John, just one comment as well. I, I'm kind of surprised we're on the third slide or so. You mentioned it, but you didn't see anywhere that, on your slide deck that you're, cloud, that you're a cloud company, a SaaS, enterprise, enterprise SaaS company. Uh, yes, that's true. We are. It's a cloud-based company, and it's a SaaS business model. So. Uh, yeah, I'm curious why haven't you? I mean, that's like the hot thing everyone's talking about. I'm <laughs> curious why you didn't bring that up. Um, I was going to hit it later. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I think just as a, as a commentary, you know, when you think about it, to Mark's point, enterprise SaaS is really hot right now, especially enterprise SaaS that's embedded in core systems and enterprises that are mission critical. And so you should really hit that right up front, that you're an enterprise SaaS company that's solving mission-critical large enterprise problems. You know, let me wait. I agree with that, but the other thing that we hear sometimes when we have somebody put that right up on the front page is um, the CEO is trying to draw us to a higher valuation because we all know what SaaS valuations are. <laughs> And so it becomes a buzzword when someone says, oh, we're cloud-based and we're SaaS and we've got three-year contracts and... Big data. You know, big data, blah, 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 blah. And what I'm hearing mobile. when I hear that mobile, is... Mobile, mobile. Okay, local, big data. Local, big data. Right, yeah. right. And I'm hearing all that, 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 you know, okay, this guy thinks he's got the best thing since sliced bread because he's putting all those buzzwords on the first few slides. And uh, so the other side of that is it's not such a bad thing necessarily to have it a little bit later and uh, soft sell it so that you actually come across as though you know what you're talking about. That's a good point. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I want to give a very specific example of how the technology works. Uh, the example shown here, here Steris. If you're a uh, service employee for Steris, you walk into a hospital, uh, you type in a me, trouble code. John, I just want to interrupt for one second. So it's very common when you're making a pitch to a VC firm for one or more of the partners to be uh, under the table with a device. <laughs> <laughs> 
I normally don't do that. That was my wife. I'm sorry. Please continue, John. <laughs> uh, we actually had a rule at Sequoia, and we'll have a rule at Drive Capital. You don't even bring him into the room. Because mm. you bring him into the room, you can't do it. But I have a six-week-old, so I apologize. My, my apologies. <laughs> Okay, let's try to move on here. So uh, with our mobile SaaS-based cloud computing platform, <laughs> we can connect a field worker to information that they need. Steris claims access to troubleshooting flowcharts solves 80% of their field issues, but when the service engineer has a problem, he or she can click the Live Connect button. It will connect them to relevant experts, either an individual or group, through an integrated communications platform that can send a text message, a post, or an email directly to those individuals. And as soon as that is received by the group of people, it's shut down by the first person who answers the question. Everyone can see the answer. Therefore, we get a peer review of the answer. And we also track the time of response. So we drive tremendous improvements in speed of response. Uh, the sort of secret sauce behind this is what we call a prioritized knowledge base. We didn't try to put all of the information onto the platform, but we prioritize an important catalog and sequence, the key information that they need to get their jobs done rapidly. And then we link all of that back to relevant experts. So for example, for a carrier, it could be electrical issues, it could be mechanical issues. Generally, those are different teams of experts. And driving that support to the right expert immediately is dramatic. John, uh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Could we go back? Um, so how much of this uh, information resides on your system? And then how, much, how long does it take you to get that information on your system to, be, to have that customer go live? And who pays for that? Yeah, so a couple of questions. We import all of the content to our cloud platform. Uh, we do that typically in a five-week process for a new HVAC customer, it's, if it were a new product line. Uh, if it's an existing carrier wholesaler, of which we're going after another 20, we have three, uh, it's 15 minutes to deploy that software. Uh, typically, it takes three to four to five weeks to get the customer ready to go with this operation. That's mostly their time, not our time. We can do it in five days. And then do they pay for that, or is that just part bundled into the, uh, the cost of the service? Uh, they, they pay professional services up front to import new content. That can be shared content uh, across multiple wholesalers, or it can be proprietary to their operations, such as unique uh, sales strategies for the Chicago region. Got it. So uh, just a little bit about my background. I spent 25 years at Philips Healthcare, started off uh, in engineering and went into marketing. Um, this concept was born through a period of time where I worked uh, uh, at Philips uh, delivering customer service to a group. Uh, that, that business model was wrapped up in bringing 100,000 users to an internet-based training program, support program, and that mushroomed to 425,000. Uh, the problem that we were focused on was taking the Philips service organization from fourth in the industry which doesn't sound so bad, but there are four people in the industry, Philips, Siemens, GE, and Toshiba. <laughs> uh, we moved to, uh, my goal was to get us to industry standard at 70% customer satisfaction as surveyed by Gallup. We blew through those numbers, uh, basically because we got to the root cause of the issue. And the root cause of the issue was not lack of training, not lack of information, but it was lack of access to experts. And because of that, we could take the revisit rate down from 20%, which in fact was industry standard, it's still the revisit rate that, that Steris and most of our customers achieve today, down to 3% because we could get the right person connected to the problem. Could I, I'll use it, John, John asked us, I mean, that slide is a great slide because it tells the venture capitalist, he, he, he did this out of passion. It's a space he's very passionate about, he's got experience in, uh, and he you know, was able to show this and wants to bring it from the one customer he was at, which was Philips, to the rest of the world. I mean, this is a great job, so. Thank you. So uh, in, in HVAC, we have compelling outcomes. Uh, we did a 60-day study with a care wholesaler here in Ohio, um, and there was an 87% reduction in calls into the help desk. Well, why was that important? These guys are stretched very thin, and when you're out in the field, you don't necessarily want to reach back into the organization and talk about how the Cleveland Indians are doing, you want to get right to the problem and get it solved and get that job done for the day. HVAC service engineers can do four or five jobs in a day and this is money in their pocket. So we reduced the number of calls in and we greatly accelerated the response time. Typically in HVAC today, it's one to three to four hours to get a response. Not because the people don't care, but they're tied up doing training, putting out a fire, troubleshooting, talking to the phone with somebody else. 
With this system, we were able to get 40% of the calls answered within six minutes. We have a revenue sharing model, so we sell to the wholesaler, they resell it to the dealer, so we've established a sales channel. Uh, so it gives revenue in the pocket for the wholesaler and provides uh, immediate benefits uh, to the dealers. They see break even in, in two and a half visits or two and a half months, uh, where our ground rule is this uh, uh, saves one revisit uh, uh, per month. I'm sorry, I'm going to be a disc I'm going to be that guy. Go go back. Um, I don't. I, uh, so I I don't understand what you just said. So I understand Which, it's good. I don't understand. Is this is this good for the the guy who's paying you is Carrier or Steris or, and how and you're now you're talking about the wholesaler channel and the dealer channel. So I'm confused on what what you're trying to say here. Yeah, so maybe I can clarify that uh, in a further slide in a little bit more deal, okay. detail. But exactly what we're trying to say here is we reduce the total number of calls in because we put the prioritized information on the smartphone, tablet, or laptop of the field employee. By doing that, oh, we reduce, reduce the calls into the corporation. Right. Got it. Thank you. I'm okay. slow. Sorry. No problem. So in HVAC, it's been compelling. 40% of issues solved in six minutes. This is dollars in their pocket. It's better service. It allows the customer, the homeowner, to get their equipment fixed better and rave to their neighbors about the quality of service, and that drives good things across the entire business model. And, and again, the reason I got into this is I, I saw a real opportunity uh, in 2009. I felt that mobile was going to take off in a very big way. Uh, what I did with internet te te technology at Philips uh, back in the day, uh, I thought would be repeated in the mobile space today. So we built a cloud-based platform that would drive this into this new market. It was a window of opportunity. And I could say, well, I'll spend another 10 years at, at Philips, or I could start this company, and I decided to take this path. John, just a question. I mean, you, when you put your first logo slide up, it looked like you served multiple industries, yet the, the, the theme of what you've been talking about here is really heavily HVAC. I mean, it's starting, starting to sound real niche -y here. Well, we, we uh, that's an interesting question. We have investors that say, focus on one niche and don't take your eyes off that. Others get into multiple verticals. I guess, yeah, what I'm trying to get to is how big is this opportunity? I, you know, I, I understand focus, but... Yeah, so uh, in HVAC, it's at least 100 million. HVAC service workers are about 6% of the mobile workforce out there. So it's about 1.5 billion in technology-enabled services for field service. It's twice that big if you look at field sales and service, and probably three times that big if you look international. So we see the market size as, as well north of 1.5 billion. We have a question? Yeah, this is a question for Mike. Mike, I've noticed a couple of times in this presentation that that John has gotten conflicting input from our panel up there. And I just wondered, as the presenter, as the entrepreneur, what advice would you give them when they're getting conflicting information on, well, gosh, I should do that or I shouldn't do that, and it's coming up against each other? You know, at the end of the day, he knows the business better than any of us. And so, you know, I think he can take our comments with a grain of salt. You know, I think ours are more from a present station presentation standpoint and getting to the point, but at the end of the day, he, he knows this business much better than we ever will. So I, I would just encourage the entrepreneurs to take the input with a grain of salt and pick up, pick up the, the comments and the input you think is valuable. But at the end of the day, it's your business. You know the business. You know what's right. And so you, you do what you think is right. No, I just, I'd reiterate that. I mean, you got to do what you believe in. Don't listen to us, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you believe, you know, you know I, I thought the way you answered the enterprise SaaS question was a great, great way to answer the question. Uh, the one thing I would mention on this last point that was just brought up is, um, I will tell you from my perspective, I'm more of a market-based investor. So I'd like to know the size of the market sooner and why I think it's a big market. Uh, because that then also says, okay, now I can get over a lot of hurdles. Uh, but uh, anyway, so it's just a, a, a side point on the market size. Yeah, you could build that up by, to Mark's point. Here's the big opportunity. We've decided to initially focus to in. focus here and then yeah. moved into these sectors. Right. Great. So uh, we do have some uh, significant barriers to entry. Uh, we believe the fundamental barrier to entry in this space is to have drive continual innovation. Uh, our focus is to understand our customers deeply so we can respond to where the hockey puck is going, not to where the ho hockey puck is. We built a prioritized knowledge base. We've already been recognized by Carrier as a best practice and with the market leader Carrier and HVAC, which drives part of our focus into that area. 
We built discovery analytics, so we track every touch point on the product now. So we know when it's being used, why it's being used, which product, and we think we know over time we'll build up the database of data to give information to carrier to help them better predict and prevent problems in the future. So uh, in terms of the size of the market, so uh, thanks for that lead in. We believe cloud computing market is, is well north of 10 billion. In technology enabled services, we see that's at least 1.5 billion. We know there are about 70 million mobile workers and we're trying to reach those mobile workers through this uh, strategy. Uh, we focused on uh, companies between 100 million and 1.5 billion, and why is that? Those 5,000 companies typically have between 100 and 1,000 mobile workers. So it's a sweet spot for this 30 to $50,000 sale, uh, which is big to us. It's not so big that these people have to go back and get into a one-year budget cycle. All of our deals had been won in a 90-day sales cycle, so that's exciting to us. We're not afraid of approaching the, the bigger companies, but we know they're gonna be slow moving. It's gonna be a multi-year budget process, uh, et cetera. Excuse me for a second, John, we have a question. How effective are the customer endorsements? Very effective. Uh, my, my, very effective. You want, if you have customers that are singing your praises, that's very important. Especially with the logos that he has on his slides. They're big companies, and so those, you know, if it's a company you never heard of, you maybe discounted some, but certainly with the big logos he has and with references from those customers, I, you know, it's meaningful. It, you know, especially in light of the prior discussion that we had earlier this morning about validation, you know, where you get out of the angel round of financing where angels are investing in the individuals, you know, we're all looking at investing in uh, the company. And so validation of, of customer adoption is, is highly critical here, especially when they're big names and there's more than one. You know, these are folks that we're going to make reference calls to, so these are critical. We have another question? Uh, we work with a company in Akron who does this for the Air Force and, and the Army, so I'm wondering how much do you qualify the IP as a real barrier to entry when it comes to software? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, our experience is uh, IP is, is in this market probably uh, limited in terms of the value because they're still a small company and the barriers to entry outside of intellectual property are going to be more important to this business, which is capturing the data on their platform, on their servers, using that data to provide meaningful analytics back to their customers and having that uh, as a history and archiving it and going back and doing deep dives. That's the barrier to entry here uh, that will be worth much more than IP. And we've all had experience uh, with IP in the software space, and it usually doesn't end well. Another question? Yeah, uh, the deck is starting to get a little busy here, uh, but I think this stands alone when you look at it later, but do you want something that's less busy uh, live? <clears throat> Uh, we just want to know the story and understand the business. So, I mean, sometimes businesses are complex, sometimes they're simple. Um, you know, you don't want to have, it's, I don't know if you watch the movie Amadeus, too many notes. Uh, but, uh, you know, you want to tell a story, and, and the story needs to talk about the business. I, I think so far it's been pretty effective. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't. Uh... Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't struck by this as being over, over the top. Well, one, one thing, uh, something that's just been rattling in my brain, and Jonathan's going to love this. Um, it seems like TOA would be a great partner for you guys. <laughs> because they got complex carriers. I mean, they could, you know, you could leverage their sales force. They could, I mean, it seems like they would be a great, would that be a potential partner for you? Absolutely. We talked about arranging a dinner next month. Yeah, I mean, because it's a very similar, I mean, you provide a knowledge system for their, for their guys and so on and so forth. Cool. So, I, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm, I'm lunch today and I'm going to be dinner next week is pretty mm -hmm. much what's happening, right? Okay, good. You know, just to follow up on that question, though, which is a good one, uh, presumably John's made this pitch a number of times, and so by going through this deck, you know, he's got to pick up where the listeners are having trouble uh, interpreting what's on the slide. And so if he wants to keep the slide consistent from one presentation to the next, he just has to do a really good job identifying areas of the slide where he's had trouble with the listeners of the audience grasping a point or two. So either change the slide going forward as a presenter or know exactly where there's sensitivity in terms of lack of uh, comprehension in pointing that out. 
Okay, so uh, just to give a very specific example, this is one targeted vertical. It's the HVAC, HVAC vertical. Uh, we are dealing now with Carrier and Linux. Collectively, they have a 40% footprint in the HVAC market. Carrier is the market leader at 23%. Linux is 17. Uh, we've got three wholesalers for Carrier, one major, the largest Linux dealer. So we sell to the wholesalers, they resell this to the dealers. So that gives us a way to reach these 267,000 mobile workers very effectively. So they act as our resellers. This is a, a long, um, continuous relationship between the sales team of the wholesalers and the dealers. So we've got a, a nice channel to go to market with. And we add Chuck, value uh, at every level in that value chain. You know, that's the one area I think where we would want to dive into because you've got a lot of uh, uh, touches you've got to get get through before you get to the end user and in terms of selling cycle maybe you'll talk about this a little bit later when you start with the OE and you're trying to get down to the dealer level you're going through somebody that you don't have control over which is the wholesaler and so you know by the time you get down there in terms of adoption and value proposition how do you make sure your message gets down there so that the you know the selling cycle can be compressed yeah so Great question. We sell to the wholesalers in the middle of this. We don't sell to Carrier or Linux. We're trying to get in there, but we've been trying that for a year, and it's going very slow. They're supportive of what we do. In fact, Carrier reimburses the wholesalers through a co-op advertising program to drive adoption. Uh, we, we don't want to wait on Carrier. These wholesalers in the middle are quick decision makers. They're family-owned businesses. They make a quick decision, and we sell to them, and they resell it to the wholesalers. So we're targeting the wholesaler, and they're reselling it to the dealers. John, we have a question. Thank you. Can you, uh, as the VCs, talk about whether you have a, a preference for a direct sales force versus a channel, or does that vary by business or industry? I'll, I'll start with that. That's where, I, that's where I was going, Lynn, because I, I think you know, the next question I would have asked is, what friction is there and what leverage is there between the wholesaler who you're going to and their ability to push this down into the, into the dealer network. And if you don't have that direct contact with the ultimate user, you know, it's just, it just says it's gonna be a longer selling cycle and you don't have the message conveyed to the user that you want. And uh, I, would, I would prefer to have the relationship with the dealer, which is the end, uh, the end customer. But it so, is, a, you know, having channel partners is a cost-effective way to go mm -hmm. to market. Direct sales forces are expensive, I think, uh, it's not a bad way to start. Ultimately, I mean, we've had good, good, sometimes they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, having a direct force, you know, that's complemented with, with channel partners can be a pretty effective model, too. Okay, so management team, uh, it's myself, uh, our CTO, Shanti Subramaniam, uh, Todd Federman from North Coast Angels, uh, Dave Lohman, who's an experienced startup uh, executive who's done a, uh, was the CFO of SageQuest, which was one of the exits that was uh, recently uh, went to market. And we have an observer from uh, Jumpstart, John Blair, on our board that helps us immensely uh, uh, getting focused on the business. We meet on a regular monthly basis. How many, how many people in the company? Uh, there's currently three full-time people. Uh, our development team is outsourced through a partnership we have with Empira, and we're in the process of bringing that partnership in-house. So we're in the middle of a capital raise now. We've closed there's a question. A Jonathan, there's a question. Hate it. What was the question? How do you feel about an outsourced development team? Hate it. Agree. <laughs> it's, at the end of the day, you own your IP, your IPC. I understand why you did that. Um, I gotta tell, from my personal experience, it'd be very difficult to get a, a real institutional person unless they got real comfortable that you owned your, your own, you owned and, and controlled your technology. Yeah, so let me just address that, assuming it came up this way. We are in the process of moving all that IP in-house. We have a yeah. two-year program to do that. It'll take 12 months to do that. That's funded through the Innovation Ohio Loan Fund, so it's a very cost-effective way to bring it in, inside. That's, that's just difficult. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, usually what you want is we'd love to have your part. You, if your partner was the CTO and your partner, you know, was the architect and put all that together uh, and then you hired your folks underneath that, that that's what you want your own engineering team. Right. And we are building our own engineering team yeah. as we speak. Yeah, it, it's because it's not a project. That's the, that's the key. You, know, you got to own it, live it, breathe it. Good point. Um, 
I hesitate to ask a question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So when a company like John's comes to Drive or to Draper or even to Glen Gary, um, who's kind of traditional institutional venture capital, what do you think of a cap chart that looks like this? Does that, does that in any way slow down your process or make it more difficult to invest or anything like that? I mean, from my viewpoint, I don't think it's overly complex. You know, we know most, we know all the people on that list and they would be the, the normal, the usual <clears throat> seed stage angel groups that we would expect to see in very early stage companies. Um, so, uh, you know, the amount of money that they've raised is not excessive. You know, we haven't yet seen kind of the results <clears throat> of that in terms of what the revenue is today, but there's nothing that I see there that is alarming or unusual to me. I, I would ask the question, and, and you don't have to answer this because you may not want to. Um, I'd ask the question, okay, those are your investors. How much of the, you know, how much of the company do they own? Uh, and quite frankly, if the angels own more than 15% of the company, that kind of screws up the cap table. They should never, I mean, it's just for an institutional perspective. And we've seen a lot of companies, I see a lot of companies in the Midwest where the angels just own too much, and then you can't. You cannot make it work for the institutional investor or, or, and, and the entrepreneur. So I want to ask you to answer that question, but that's, that's another way of answering uh, your question. Not to beat a dead horse on, the, on Empire, did, did, they, did they take a sweat equity position then, and how would you unravel that if you're bringing it in-house? Oh, I'm asking the VCs, according to Jonathan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's a good point. You know, what percentage of your capital is going to the outsourced uh, engineering team? Yeah, so... Uh, I could ask your question. How's that? The uh, Empire has a, a, uh, approximately 15% investment in the company of equity. Um, and we're, we're paying developers to do two things, continue to develop the platform and transition that software into our in-house team. Uh, that's a six-month project that we're going to execute over a two-year period with the Innovation Ohio Loan Fund. Okay, so again, we're in the, the middle of this raise. We're looking for another uh, $380,000 to complete this round, which would lead us to uh, looking to potential investment capital uh, from a VC one to two years down the road. So here's the, the VC question. Uh, what's the monthly burn? How much money has already been uh, invested and burned? And, uh, you know, is the money going into uh, uh, cover expenses that have been accrued? In other words, you know, uh, how much money do you need and how long will it last? Yeah, so the monthly burn right now is about $40,000 a month. That's going to be ramping up to, towards the end of the year. This capital raise will uh, allow us to run for 15 months at the ramped up burn rate. Uh, we expect to bring in... Um, about $500,000 in the next 12 months in terms of additional uh, cash flow and equity. We collect the cash uh, either six months or 12 months in advance of deployment. So we have a, a very nice cash flow model that supports the growth of the company. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in here for a second. And I want your guys on the panel honest opinion about what you took away from that last slide and the conversation around it. Messy cap table. You know, obviously we haven't seen the cap table, but one could jump to that conclusion, I guess. Uh, or capital know, structure, I'd the, probably say. The, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with, you know, all of those, those investors. I guess, it, you know, how that would translate to an actual cap table would be interesting to see as well. You know, the, I think the Innovation Ohio Loan Fund is, you know, is a great program, a low, low cost capital. You know, it's great that you're, you know, not taking any dilution and you have that money to deploy. That's a, that's a great move on your part that you got the million dollars there. But uh, you might, you know, how this translated to an actual cap table would be interesting. You know, at this point, I'm not necessarily thinking about the cap chart as I am about this slide, um, which is how much money is being raised. And the thing we would jump to is we work well with three of the organizations up there that are identified, uh, North Coast, OTAP, and Jumpstart. So that's a good thing for us. But the primary concern I'm thinking about at this point is, is this raise enough? And what this is starting to put into my mind is the risk that we all face as early stage investors is the financing risk 
that is going to be inherent in this business as it continues to grow and require more capital. So the real question in my mind is, is this raise enough? If we put money in this raise, uh, who's coming in after us, and how long do we have to raise more capital? That's, that's what I'm getting from this slide. And, and Steve, do you have a rule of thumb for how much capital a company like this should be raising in different phases? Uh, not a rule of thumb, per se, but uh, I'd like to know who's in the deal, who has the ability to write follow-on checks, uh, what the burn is, uh, what the milestones are in the business, looking at the revenue projections. So it's not a simple uh, rule of thumb. It's a, it's a, a little bit deeper dive in, in what the company's projections look like. Over there, Tony, or keep going. We got a question over here. And that doesn't seem to bother you. You know, when's the first sale going to be? I heard they're going to be thirty to fifty thousand. It's a ninety-day sales cycle. That sounded, gosh, I wish, but that sounded great. But you know, when is that? When in the presentation is that sort of uh, uh, concern ra raising in your mind, and you want to hear, okay, when are you going to sell something? Well, that uh, I'll just mention that's that last that point came up for me anyway in the last slide which is the answer I gave, which is, okay, if you're raising X amount of dollars, how long is that going to last? And so I start thinking about what the burn is, when are they going to convert customers to revenues, when are they going to collect the cash from those customers, and then what is the financing risk? Right. Well, I, I, I'm assuming we're still going to see a P&L right. and a timeline, so I'm assuming that yeah. right still. The money slide. The money slide. <laughs> yeah. so you know what's coming. Well, we hope it's coming. Well, we hope it's coming. It's not coming. <laughs> it we got an issue. <laughs> yeah, so um, really the use of funds are to execute on the HVAC go-to-market model. We believe that will be 70 to 80 percent of our revenue in the next two years. We closed last year at $135,000 in revenue. We have f five paying customers at this point, Steris, RSC, Sigler, Cook, and a Linux up in Chicago. How uh, much deferred, since it's a SaaS-based model, how much deferred revenue did you go into 2013 with? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know that off the top of yeah, my head. That's but it's, it. You should know that answer. It's yep. a, it, because that, that's the value of the SaaS-based model, is you right. have deferred revenue going into the next period. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and we also want to improve the, improve the platform to add features, and more importantly, to add content. So we lock in the HVAC customers to drive the price and do the, the technology transition. The value creating milestones for the fund would be to hit cash flow break even and roughly a $1 million recurring revenue, which would self sustain the business going forward. We have a question? Uh -huh. uh, to the panel. Um, okay. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? So, just to be a little contrarian, um, this, this cash flow break even as a, as, a, uh, as a milestone, value creating milestone. What are the thoughts on that? I, you know, I, I kind of get it in terms of, you know, if, if investors go away, you can sustain the business. However, it'd be easy not to be cash flow if you could grow faster. And I, I sometimes think in the Midwest, we get really centered on that cash flow break even at, to, at the expense of creating value and investment yep. return. I'm kind of answering the question, but what do you guys think? Well, I think, you know, it's a good point, uh, Mark, in that we all know what it costs to really launch and run an enterprise SaaS company that is going to be meaningful. And it's certainly more than $1.75 million that, he, that John wants to raise at this point. And so on some level, that, that you know, settles is not a very ambitious plan, but understanding he's got to balance that with the reality of the market he's trying to raise, raise funds in today. But, um, you know... I think in terms of thinking big at this stage on 1.75 million, the cash flow break even sounds like perhaps not a shooting, shooting, for, the, shooting for the stars. The, uh, if, I, if I saw that slide in Silicon Valley, it'd be a very different slide. The slide would be, it's gonna take me $12 million in 18 months to go to cash flow break, break even. Yep. Whatever the number is, I mean, 8 million, 6 million, 12 million, whatever the number is. And it would be in the future, but then I'd also see, you know, 100% growth, 200% growth. So you basically trade off break, you know, your, your time to break even because the cost of sales forces, cost of everything you're doing with, with growth rate. Now, what you don't want to have is, you know, 18 months to break even and a 15% growth rate. That doesn't work. Uh, so that, that, that would be the difference uh, of a Silicon Valley type 
look versus what we see more in the Midwest. Okay, so the financials, again, we um, uh, expect to uh, get in the first year at post funding uh, up to about 8, 836. Uh, about 33% uh, of that will be from uh, existing revenues going forward. So maybe that is in fact the answer to your question. So about a third of the revenue in year one would be from uh, existing customer base. So we need to get two thirds of that. So it's substantial growth, but if we can retain our customers, and so far we've been able to do that. Uh, our first customer, Steris, uh, signed up with a 21% price increase. Our second major customer, RSC, uh, re-upped with a 33% price increase. Uh, we see this locking in between the wholesalers and dealers and HVAC as the new way of working. So we think we have good lock-in. Uh, again, it's not a significant growth in customers. We need to get uh, from five existing customers to 25 in the, in the next 12 months and double that up to 60 in year two. That would get us to this cash flow break-even model with the $1.75 million investment plus the, uh, uh, the Innovation Ohio Loan Fund. Question, John, um, for the panel. Is this a big enough opportunity to get you interested? I, I'd say, as far as what I know of the market, again, I gotta do a deep dive on it. I, I would say yes. Um, just from my perspective, in an early stage company, I, I don't even care about year four and year five. Um, I'd max go out to year three. Uh, and. Uh, Actually, that's a pretty good story, through, if you believe that, through year three. Uh, mm -hmm. And as, as you just mentioned, it, you know, your, if your deferred revenue is like 300 k or 250 or whatever you said going into year one, that's great. By the way, I don't like year one, year two. Year, this is just a personal thing. That's 2013. Next year's 2014. Next year's 2015. Uh, but no, I, you know, the, the question I would ask then is, okay, let's say uh, you had $5 million. What would you do then? and understanding how that would affect your, your business model and grow faster, back to Mark's question uh, a while ago. Okay, we have another question. A question for the panel that seems to coming up here is, so when you see something like ARR, are you used to looking at a software as a service model in terms of cash flow numbers or in terms of gap-based numbers? And do you, do you ask questions like backlog? You know, because you mentioned, Mark, deferred revenue several times. Uh, and being an accountant, I know what that means, but a lot of entrepreneurs probably don't know what that means. So, can you just comment on that? Well, I mean, the most important numbers in a SaaS company really are the growth in ARR, you know, annual recurring revenue, uh, and then cash flow, because they should cash flow pretty nicely. Uh, your gap revenue stinks in a, I mean, in a SaaS company for a long time, so you almost dismiss that. You basically look at gross margin, um, but that's basically what I look at. Yeah, I agree. Because we I mean one of the things you'd really be interested in was in, is the size of his contracts. You know what the contract backlog is in an enterprise with big customers like this. I'd expect to see probably long-term contracts of some significance. With perhaps we'd also be looking to see how much of that he's getting paid up front. That's going to create the deferred revenue that Mark's referring to. So you know even though you know this this is delivery on a month-to-month -month basis, you still like to see an enterprise SaaS model where you're getting significant payments up front. Yeah, you also like to see, I mean, for example, if those, in, I don't know if what your customers are, but a lot of these, if you can have them pay up front for the first year, that obviously significantly helps cash flow, but also says the commitment the companies have to your business. In the SaaS-based model, I'm personally not a big fan of, uh, of uh, contracts longer than three years, because it's really hard to figure out what your value is to the customer after year three, uh, and you want to raise your prices. I mean, being the founding investor in LinkedIn, I will tell you we charge a lot more today per seat than we did three years ago, than we did six years ago. Uh, so you want to have that flexibility. Same thing with Salesforce. You know, when I first looked at investing in Salesforce, it was $30 a month. And for you guys on Salesforce, it's no longer $30 a month. So you want to have that flexibility to raise the price as your value proposition goes up. I have another question? This is a question kind of on format and content up there. Is this a format that you prefer to see rather than the graphic, you know, typical hockey stick that you sometimes see? And are those the components that, do you need to see all those components? Or would you rather someone chose two or three of those to put onto a chart if that's your preferred method? So what's your preferred method and what components would you like to see? Kind of depends 
on the business. Yeah, yeah, it depends on the business, but this is perfectly adequate for what we like to see uh, versus charts. Uh, I, I'd much prefer to see numbers and you know whether or not year four and five matter so much uh, because it's not going to be what, what those numbers are. We know that those are wrong, but it does give some sense of what the entrepreneur is thinking about in terms of size. In the uh, recurring revenue line is the most important thing for us to look at because that's the driver of valuation for a SaaS-based business. So, you know, that's the first thing we take away from that. And then the second thing is you look at the EBIT line and, you know, it's not a huge consumer uh, of cash to develop the business. So at least it just puts it into some kind of context uh, whether or not we should put more money into this business to accelerate its growth is a different question. We have a couple more minutes. John, we're going to let you finish your deck now without any further interruptions. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we're looking at a, you know, a number of different exit strategies within the uh, HVAC vertical could go very quickly. We've identified uh, at least one OEM and a half a dozen distributors that are of the right size that could take this as a strategic advantage to them. Uh, it's an it's a industry with a great rivalry. It's personal because it's family-owned businesses. Uh, some of these distributors would like to do nothing other than buy us to just stick it in the eye of the other guy. Uh, but we've also got great uh, you know, uh, ability to improve their bottom line and, and lock in their dealers because it's a net sum game. We could also look at a private equity roll up within the HVAC. We think that's not the best way to exit. We think a horizontal exit into the technology enabled services space would be a bigger, broader exit for us. Uh, and that would be the, the other direction we would take. Uh, once we've proven ourselves in one, two, or three verticals, we can show that somebody that's in multiple verticals could take this technology bolted onto a, a TOA kind of platform that's already in the space and rapidly move it out into multiple verticals. I, I have to say so. I hate exit slides. Mm -hmm. Then you're not building a company. You're building it. You're flipping it. I hate exit slides. <laughs> so, me. What's that? The question was, what, how do the rest of the VCs feel about exit slides? You know, for me, what I got from that slide more than anything was is, is thinking about how big John is thinking in terms of this opportunity and you know to lead with an exit within a vertical like HVAC tells me eh, not so big and whereas now if you if you lead with the horizontal technology enabled service then I start thinking well perhaps it could be a little bit bigger but that was my takeaway from that as opposed to you know you know we can all use our heads to think about what potential exit opportunities are but it, for me it's more telling about what they're thinking about. Uh, let's, let's let John finish, because we, we've, we've got just a couple minutes left. Yeah, so we're looking at uh, really a target-rich exit environment. We've identified a few people that would be uh, potential buyers for us, uh, not necessarily somebody like a, uh, a Oracle, because we're too small, but within that adjacent space to Oracle, we certainly see some opportunities there sure. with these horizontal exits, which would be the preferable exit strategy. We know when we hit an exit window, we want to be in a high growth mode, so we want to be prepared for that exit. We know the multipliers go up with the growth rate. So if we can have a predictable sales process, be able to onboard customers systematically, have a strong customer base and funded for growth, uh, we can uh, have a great exit, uh, whether that's one year, two years, five years out. Uh, we also know that negative growth, if we start an exit discussion and, and we start to lose business or even slow down, it kills the multiple. So we have to prepare ourselves over the next two to three years to hit that window in the right way. So we believe we validated a go-to-market strategy. We've got uh, customer-proven technology, best practice from uh, carrier, the market leader. Uh, market traction, a great explosive market, uh, cloud-based SaaS business model, mobile technology. We've got a strong and capable team. Uh, we need capital to grow our business. First wave is to close out this angel round at around 350 more, which we hope to do by the end of March. And then in year two, three, uh, we could bring in additional growth capital, which could really accelerate our, our business uh, and, and we hope to have the uh, opportunity to present that to the VCs at a later date. One, one more round for the, the VCs, and then we'll thank everybody for the panel. Uh, just a final uh, comment, that, uh, and some of you have heard me say this before, but when we listen to an entrepreneur pitch, uh, we listen very carefully to the words that an entrepreneur, entrepreneur uses, especially the pronouns, and uh, commend John for the use of the words our and we. Uh, always, and it's a team of you know less than a handful of people. But it's always always thinking about the company and we and our, and didn't use the pronouns I and my. 
And so that says something about him in terms of his uh, belief in the company and where he wants to go. And it's not a, uh, uh, an extension of John's ego to build this company, but he wants to build it because he believes strongly in what he's producing and selling to customers. And that's, uh, that's a pretty important factor for us. And that goes back to the earlier discussion about do you bet on a jockey or do you bet on a horse? Do you bet on a jockey? So uh, that's important to us. I just wanted to thank John for this is not an easy thing to do. It's his baby. He's passionate about it. And uh, He's allowed it to us to ask questions and you know kind of uh, poke at his uh, his business uh, in in a public forum. And so, John, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, congrats on doing that. I mean, that's 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 great. I think what you've done is fantastic. I, I will just say, you know, my net in. Um, I, you know, I, I think you have a very interesting business. I think you're thinking too small. Um, and uh, I would implore you to just really focus on building a great company. Uh, don't, the exit takes care of itself. The, all this other stuff takes care of itself. Just focus on, on building a phenomenal company. And I, I think you're in a market space. I, I've seen a lot of comp. I mean, I think it's interesting. So I, I, I think you're headed in the right direction. So congratulations. Thank right, you, thanks. John. And thank you, panel. Please join me in a round of applause. Wow. Uh, I'm going to add my thanks as well. I, I mentioned to uh, John before he got up here that he was the sacrificial lamb, and, and I was expecting you know, slaughter, which is what we usually have. But John, you did a great job. So thank you, everyone.